Hello, I'm Robert Emmett Hernan. I'm uh, head of Blue Stack Productions, the publisher of Irish Environment, an online magazine covering environmental matters on the island of Ireland. And I'm very happy today to be here in Belfast with uh, Edward Wright. Edward, how are you? Very well, thank you. Edward, now you're the uh, director for the Arena Network, mm -hmm. which is part of the um, business in the community for Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, could you tell us, uh, before you joined the group here, what, what was your background? What was your my background was um, as a private sector environmental consultant, so I undertook a lot of projects uh, for business around compliance, industrial pollution permitting, planning, and also waste management strategy for uh, the government here as well. And when did you join the, the business community? Two and a half years ago. Two and a half years ago. And um, uh, what does ARENA stand for? It's the ARENA Network for the business in the community. Yes, um, ARENA Network stands for a Regional Environmental Network Association. Okay. We were set up 20 years ago this year okay. by um, the business membership organisations within Northern Ireland to address environmental issues. And was there any triggering event at that time, 20 years ago? Um, I think or there just was just a growing awareness mm -hmm. that business had to play its part and had to respond fully. Okay. And um, the, the, what's the distribution of the kinds of businesses that belong to your organization? Are, are they tend to be large, small, mixed, or what kinds of sizes? Well, business in the community is quite interesting. Uh, we were in uh, Northern Ireland have 260 members. Mm -hmm. um, throughout the UK, we have 860 members. So proportionally, that's an awful lot of um, members coming from Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, we represent probably a third of all employed people in Northern Ireland. Uh -huh. So that's a significant amount of people. Uh -huh. Now, um, as you'll hear from, from other people in the business community here, um, the businesses in Northern Ireland are dominated by small to medium sized enterprises. Mm -hmm. uh, we have fewer of the bigger companies that you would see elsewhere in the south or in the rest of the UK. Uh, and are there, uh, are there agricultural groups that, that belong to your, to your organisation? We do. We have um, a lot of the big uh, food and drink companies okay. are, are involved with us. Moy Park will be a name most people here will be aware of. Uh -huh. um, Linden Foods and Dumbia. So we have um, a large representation by the food and drink industry. Okay. Uh, but do you work with the farming community itself, with the, the Farmers Union or other groups? We um, do have the Ulster Farmers Union um, sit on our steering group, so uh -huh. we do try to work with them where we can. Okay. Um, and the, what's the funding for the organisation? Well, the funding for the organisation comes from an extent from membership money. Uh -huh. So there's obviously a charge for um, being a member of business in the community. Mm -hmm. um, we also receive um, a lot of funding from the Northern Ireland Environment Agency. Uh -huh. We are one of their three strategic partners uh, to help them interact and work with the business community. Uh -huh. We also would undertake uh, distinct project work for people. This could be private sector work oh. or it could be from another environmental charity or organization wanting some work done. So with the business committee there might be some fee generating work that you yep. do for them? Okay. So it would be straight private sector style consultancy work where, where possible. For instance we're exploring okay. opportunities around the new energy savings opportunity scheme uh -huh. that businesses of a certain size have to do so we'd be able to provide them support. Okay. And, and what's the staffing size of the uh, organization? We would have five full-time staff and then generally one or two placement students working with us. Okay. Now, Ed, I wonder if you could tell the audience what the uh, business in the community in Northern Ireland is and what it does in a general way? Generally, business in the community is a, a corporate responsibility organization. Mm -hmm. Its aim is to harness business to be a source for good. Mm -hmm. um, we like to split our operations into um, three areas. So there's planet, which obviously covers the environmental strand. Um, there's people, which is our work in health and well-being, and place, which is our work with communities. So we try to get businesses to engage with their community, their place, be it helping um, other small businesses, providing board members to charity boards, a whole range of things. Okay. Now, I thought we would focus on a couple of those mm -hmm. projects that you're involved with. And certainly one of the, the larger projects that you do is the Environmental Benchmarking mm -hmm. Survey. I wonder if you could tell the audience what that yeah. is. It's a very interesting project we've been running now since 1998. Mm -hmm. The purpose of the Benchmarking Survey is to establish the performance of um, business within Northern Ireland. Uh, this is done through um, an annual, uh, quite a detailed um, database questionnaire uh -huh. that the businesses complete um, 
and then this is subject to some external uh, review, so it's an independent authoritative survey. Mm -hmm. um, the interesting thing, and what we have done with the survey, is it's no longer simply a benchmarking exercise. Mm -hmm. uh, we've ratcheted up the requirements. If you would request, the, if you, sorry, if you looked at the scoring mm -hmm. 20 years ago, 18 years ago, from what we look at now, you'll have seen this, this sea change. Mm -hmm. And the thing that pleases me most is many businesses have said to us, oh, we only started taking, for instance, our transport seriously because mm -hmm. you told us it was going to be an area of um, interest in the uh -huh. survey. Okay. So it's actually generated change mm -hmm. and not just benchmarking. Recently, we're also looking to expand the survey. So we're introducing things like the top performers. We're going to have a Chatham House rule style meeting of the environmental practitioners there. Okay. So in an open environment, they can share what succeeded for them, what isn't working, and help each other. So we use it for more than just the benchmarking. There's a lot of good things we can get out of it. Are, are you finding over the years that they're within the small and medium uh, enterprises that they're becoming people with major responsibilities for the environmental issues addressing by that company? Um, there is, I suppose there's two cut-off points there would be, as you uh, hinted at there, there's a size threshold. So mm -hmm. for very small companies, it's not practical to have someone with too much environmental responsibility. Mm -hmm. But there's also an industry sector element. Uh -huh. So construction will have quite a strong environmental wing, uh -huh. um, the same waste industry, obviously. Mm -hmm. And food and drinks, certainly in the past 10 years, it's become more of a priority. Now, uh, talking about waste is one of the issues that you've uh, dealt with too is, is your Towards Zero Waste campaign mm -hmm. from last year. Mm -hmm. If you yeah. could talk just what that is. Right. Well, um, so we talked previously about our membership. Our membership ranges from big organizations, thousand people, multinational companies, down to um, four men and a dog um, in a rented <laughs> office of Belfast. Yeah. So we needed something to engage everybody with resource efficiency and waste. Yeah. Now, for um, people like the multinationals, they often have things in hand. Mm -hmm. um, so what support they want would be very different from, say, a small five-man construction business who are at the early stages of this. Mm -hmm. So we have a campaign called Towards Zero Waste, which um, provides help to these businesses depending on their needs. Mm -hmm. So at the higher level, we're pushing people to engage with the ideas of a circular economy, which we've done a lot of research work, we're trying to get buy-in in Northern Ireland on that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's quite interesting, subtle work, mm -hmm. down to the small businesses where you more or less say, you know what, if you segregate your waste, uh -huh. centre recycling, you will save money. Right. So this is a campaign we're trying to get everybody involved, different levels for different organisations. Now it's interesting too that you've also done a good bit of work on, on, the, uh, on the energy on the energy issue for these groups. And the interesting thing is, uh, is that uh, both in course waste and energy, there's this cost saving component, which is attractive to all the businesses. But what's more interesting is in your last survey, you found that there was very few companies that were highlighting biodiversity. And rather than just kind of, all right, that's the survey result, you've now actually taken uh, an initiative on that called yep. bio, biodiversity uh, and business. And what, what's happening with that? This came out of two things. It came out of the, as you highlighted, the last survey with few people regarding this as a significant issue. Mm -hmm. It also came out of the draft um, Northern Ireland Biodiversity Strategy uh -huh. um, up to 2020. Um, we sit on a group that oversees a lot of the work in this area. We saw the draft uh -huh. and saw in 30 odd pages the word business occurs twice. Yeah. And you cannot, if you're, uh, we all know, um, business is a big degrader or the potential degrader and has a great role to pay in biodiversity. You can't address the issue and ignore business. Uh -huh. So coming out of that, we've developed the charter. Um, we set out with a series of objectives. Uh -huh. First of all, to provide a framework to help businesses manage biodiversity appropriately. Secondly, to provide some recognition for them in terms of what they have done so it can be useful third party uh, point of view. We also wanted to upskill their, their employees um, so that their employees would take what they learn home so you're getting an extra impact there and we also wanted to integrate um, environmental charities, uh, ENGOs with the business community. Uh -huh. So those are our objectives and we developed um, a charter then uh -huh. that's at a series of levels 
um, at the very early levels because again we have very small businesses yeah. it's simple stuff about having a policy thinking about what you can influence in, what are you purchasing uh -huh. and a wee bit of staff training is there stuff they can do at home uh -huh. um, up to the more advanced levels where we ask organisations to really think about their activities, products and services uh -huh. and their impact on biodiversity. Uh -huh. People would say to us, surely these issues of biodiversity in the supply chain and how you act should be picked up in an environmental management system. Uh -huh. But having spent nearly 20 years writing environmental management systems, yeah. I know this doesn't happen. Yeah. Um, so this is a way to prod people to do this and that's the kind of unique element of this scheme. There are obviously other marks and awards you can get for um, good st state management and land management but it's not just about that with us. Business organisation, we want them to consider how they operate their business and its impact on biodiversity. Yeah, and what's, what's I think uh, admirable about this whole project is that with, with waste and with energy, you've got this cost-saving component, which is attractive, yeah. and you don't quite have that with biodiversity okay. with these. And so it's a harder sell, is it? For, or how do you sell this? That's a very interesting people? question. So for you're right in a way, but not completely. Uh -huh. If you look at construction companies, construction companies and quarrying companies are quite bought into this. Mm -hmm. Uh, the advantage for them is on tender point um, tender documents now they're um, receiving points for initiatives such as this of biodiversity and social elements as well uh -huh. so there is a economic logical rationale for them to do it uh -huh. so that's great uh -huh. they're our bedrock um, now hopefully um, people will push this down the supply chain so we want to talk to the government in terms of right what do you require of your contractors can uh -huh. we get something written in there uh -huh. um, and the other side of things that's the that's the meat and drink of it uh -huh. the other side we have a lot of businesses here who want to engage with this issue because they want to do the right thing mm -hmm. now that is slightly more precarious because if the MD changes maybe the new one won't want to do the, the right thing uh -huh. but there's a lot of organizations that want to do it for that reason and also there's a lot of um, PR to be had from that mm -hmm. so some of the PR um, some of the organisations that would benefit most from uh -huh. good PR, um, such as maybe transport companies, can see the benefit of this as well. Uh -huh. So it's not quite as simple. There's, there's no financial benefit. There is, but it's harder to tease out and justify. Yes, yeah, interesting. I did an interview recently with the head of the uh, BirdLife in Europe, um, and they work with the cement industry mm -hmm. for those mining projects where the mining companies have finally realised if we're on board with the environmental groups, they can actually turn some of those sites yep. into... Uh, wetland protections while they're mining yep. and then they avoid all the expense of the fights that they're going to have otherwise. Some of the practical projects coming out of this have been great. A lot of them have been around the quarry. So one of our pilot companies is Quarry and they're restoring the habitat as they go and it's, it's been some really good things coming yeah, out of this. Yeah, it's yeah. a terrific encouragement. Yeah. Now one of the uh, things as part of your charter is the very last thing is the foster links between environmental organizations and, and business and community. Um, how are you, is that going in terms of fostering that connection between business? It's been a historic fight, but mm -hmm. it seems modifying it these days a bit. It is. One of the interesting things we do with that, with that um, is through the Biodiversity Charter Framework. So we are a business membership organization. We are five or six environmentalists, but we are business-based environmentalists. We know about pollution. We know about energy. Mm -hmm. We know about waste. What we don't know is detail of um, biodiversity and ecology. Uh -huh. So our role in this charter, so some of the companies, we ask people, for instance, to review what they have and understand what they have and what can be done. Uh -huh. We as an organization can't do that. But our linking role is to say, you know what, phone John Smith uh -huh. at the RSPB or Ulster Wildlife or Conservation Volunteers because uh -huh. they know. And these uh -huh. companies, these organizations are always quite pleased to come on site and build their own links with the businesses. Uh -huh. So we're using the ENGOs to support the businesses, uh -huh. which helps meet the ENGOs objectives, uh -huh. helps meet the business objectives of meeting the charter. Now, uh, also, I think you, you mentioned to me that you're <clears throat> beginning to uh, initiate discussions with your counterpart in the Republic of Ireland to see if there are possibilities for cross-border projects, if you could tell us a little bit about that. Yes, we have um, <coughs> business in the community Ireland, who mm -hmm. our sister organisation, mm -hmm. and um, through our team we have strong links with organisations um, that deal with natural capital in Ireland as well. Mm -hmm. So at the minute, what we're trying to do is scope out opportunities 
for us to develop the biodiversity charter on a north-south basis uh -huh. and expand it and hopefully build in some natural capital reporting and accounting elements. Uh -huh. um, the same is true for climate change adaptation in business, uh -huh. which I think is an overlooked area of climate change. Certainly in Ireland, north and south businesses have done very little in terms of preparing for the impacts of climate change, be that in other countries and their supply chains or be it locally uh -huh. in terms of flooding. Um, we're yeah. very lucky in that my counterpart in uh, Dublin, my sister organisation, uh, her previously previous role was to um, work in Scotland running the Scottish Climate Change Adaptation uh, Project. Yeah. So we plan to mm. see how yeah. we can work with my colleagues in the South and also Climate Northern Ireland uh -huh. to develop a cohesive offering that will help business respond to the issues of climate change. We've already mm. started this by doing some basic survey work to establish the current level of business attitudes uh -huh. and where we need to take them. <coughs> now, we've been talking a lot about focusing on how uh, business can work with the environmental mm -hmm. groups. Um, what would, advice would you give to the environmental groups on how they best can work with the, with the business community? Interesting um, question. I would say make sure you come in with something to offer. Mm -hmm and make sure you pick the right person at the right time. Uh -huh. um, and remember, it's not simply about funding, as most environmental groups nowadays know. Uh -huh. um, there's a lot of in-kind support that could be done. Uh -huh. um, try and tailor what you offer to the needs of the company. Uh -huh. If you can even talk, not necessarily to the environmental person, but maybe to their CR representative and see how you can work with them uh -huh. around issues such as charity of the year, volunteering days, whatever the company's up to. So there are opportunities, mm -hmm. but don't just go to the environmental person. Great, that's very helpful. Ed. Thanks for talking with us today.